You're listening to Breaking the Bottle Legacy with Molly Watts, episode 18. Hi, I'm Molly. After a lifetime living under the influence of family alcohol abuse, spending more than 30 years worrying about alcohol and my own drinking, believing I had an unbreakable daily drinking habit, I changed my relationship with alcohol forever. If you want to change your drinking habits, then Breaking the Bottle Legacy is for you. My goal is to help you create a peaceful relationship with alcohol, past, present, and future. Each week, I'll focus on real science and using your own brain to change your relationship with alcohol. Nothing has gone wrong. You're not broken. You're not sick. It's not your genes. And creating peace is possible. I'm here to help you do it. Let's start now. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Breaking the Bottle Legacy with me, your host, Molly Watts, coming to you from a fairly decent Oregon right now. It's been off and on this week, but mostly on. And as we head into the deeper months of spring and summer, I don't know, you guys are going to get tired of hearing it because I'm just going to talk about how beautiful Oregon is in the summer. And if you haven't made a trip out to the Pacific Northwest with the travel restrictions starting to lift, I highly encourage it. This week on the podcast, I actually in full transparency will say that I recorded this interview quite a while ago, and I struggled with whether or not to publish it because there's a little bit of background noise in the back, and we couldn't clean it up. So I held it for a while. But I've re listened to it. And honestly, the information in it is so good and so important. And I really wanted to be able to share it with you. So I'm going to talk first a little bit about why it's so important. And then I will we'll jump right into that that interview. The interview itself is with Dr. James Moss. And Dr. Moss is a, a sleep doctor. He is also the CEO of Sleep for Success. He has been a professor at the Weill Cornell Medical College uh, for years and years and has taught more than 65,000 students, a a world record actually, uh, while he was on the faculty for Cornell. And he is a leading um, researcher and somebody that has really been studying sleep medicine for, well, gosh, since the 1960s. He's also the person who coined the term power nap. And he's been on some pretty big stages in including the Oprah show and Good Morning America and and lots of different spots. So I really was so appreciative of Dr. Moss and his time. And our conversation about alcohol and sleep is important, not only just because of the combination, like I said, for for how alcohol impacts your sleep, because sleep deprivation is a problem for so many people. So I think anybody could listen to this episode and get a lot out of it because he gives tips that don't have anything to do with alcohol. And then also we talk about alcohol and sleep. Before we get into that conversation, I want to just give you some of the medical terminology and medical happenings, what happens when you drink alcohol and then try to sleep. The relationship between alcohol and sleep has been studied since the 1930s, yet many aspects of this relationship are still unknown. Research has shown sleepers who drink large amounts of alcohol before going to bed are often prone to delayed sleep onset, meaning they need more time to fall asleep, which is probably contrary to what many of you think. As liver enzymes metabolize the alcohol during their night and the blood alcohol level decreases, these individuals are more likely to experience sleep disruptions and decreases in sleep quality. To understand how alcohol impacts sleep, it's important to discuss different stages of the human sleep cycle. A normal sleep cycle consists of four different stages, three non-rapid eye movement stages and one rapid eye movement stage. So basically, (laughs) these four stages repeat in a cyclical fashion throughout the night, and each cycle should last roughly 90 to 120 minutes, which... Dr. Moss will talk about in that conversation. And it results in basically four to five cycles for every night for every eight hours of sleep. And for the first one or two cycles, 
non-REM slow wave sleep is dominant, whereas REM sleep typically lasts no longer than 10 minutes. For later cycles, these rules will flip and REM will become more dominant, sometimes lasting 40 minutes or longer without interruption. And non-REM sleep will essentially cease during these cycles. Drinking alcohol before bed can add to the suppression of REM sleep during the first two cycles. Since alcohol is a sedative, sleep onset is often shorter for drinkers, right? So you fall asleep quicker, and some fall into deep sleep rather quickly. As the night progresses, this can create an imbalance between slow wave sleep and REM sleep, resulting in less of the latter and more of the former. This decreases overall sleep quality, which can result in shorter sleep duration and more sleep disruptions. So that's just like the basic bottom line fact of what alcohol does to you and and why it is actually a not true that that drinking alcohol helps you sleep better, which is what a lot of people think. So that is one of the reasons that I really wanted to talk to a sleep specialist and was just so appreciative of my conversation with Dr. Moss. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. James Moss and our conversation on alcohol and sleep. Hello, Dr. Moss. Thank you so much for joining me on Breaking the Bottle Legacy. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I appreciate you also saying to call you Jim. So (laughs) thank you so much for being here. Okay, it's my pleasure. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I talked a little bit in the introduction about all of your, uh, your expertise on sleep and why, you know, the the amount of study and research and students that you've taught in terms of sleep science and psychology. But let me ask you first, as we head into this really important conversation about sleep deprivation, how much since you started first studying sleep science, which was a while ago now, right, you started studying it really kind of were a pioneer in this in this field. How much has sleep deprivation changed or how much more prevalent has it become since you started look, researching this back in the 1960s? <laughs> That's a, a great question. We used to sleep 10 hours a night. <laughs> uh-huh. Wow. And then it went to nine, <laughs> then it went to eight, then it went to seven, and now about 30% of the adult population is getting six or less. Oh. And our teenagers, I finally finally call them walking zombies, <laughs> they need nine and a quarter sleep hours of sleep a night to be fully alert all day long, and they average 6.1. Oh. So the majority, the vast majority of our high school and college kids are really very seriously sleep deprived. And it has deleterious consequences, which we are about to talk about, yeah. uh, that will affect them uh, not only in school and athletics and socially, but it will affect their health, uh, their cognition, their longevity uh, for the rest of their life. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that obviously we, we all probably know and understand, and it's kind of an accepted um, idea these days that screen time has really impacted our, our sleep, and it is definitely impacting our teenagers and our youth sleep as well. Back in the 60s, we just didn't have the amount of screens that we do these days, and I know that that is certainly something that is causative, I'm sure, for sleep deprivation. When you consider the uh, amount of time a teen spends either on the internet, on the phone, watching TV, playing video games, yeah, it amounts to close to nine hours a day. Right. More I mean, out, might out. be <laughs> studying with half their brain, <laughs> right? But they're tuned into uh, emails and a lot of distractions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, that, like I said, I, I think that everybody kind of accepts and understands that that's definitely one area that we can, you know, that, that has to be addressed when we're talking about improving our sleep health. What I definitely wanted to talk with you about today was the, how alcohol impacts sleep, because I think that there's a lot of misconception 
uh, people believe that drinking alcohol actually helps them sleep better. And that's just not the truth, is it? No, not at all. Alcohol might induce sleep, Mm -hmm. but it certainly disrupts sleep. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you uh, drink late in the evening, uh, it's going to uh, affect you about 90 minutes after sleep onset during your first REM or rapid eye movement period, the period in which a lot of uh, dreaming takes place. uh, That period is going to be destroyed and fragmented. Mm -hmm. So your sleep is actually going to be worse as a result of drinking alcohol rather than than better. Yeah. So, well, within three hours of bedtime, no alcohol, no mm-hmm. caffeine after two in the afternoon, Ooh. even chocolate <laughs> uh, after two in the afternoon inhibits REM sleep, as does any smoking. Wow. Uh, uh, any tobacco, chewing tobacco. You see Major League Baseball players spitting tobacco all over the dugout, and uh, they don't realize it's going to affect their sleep at night. Right. As well as uh, can uh, produce uh, mouth cancer. Oh, yeah. Thankfully, I'm going to say that I don't have any tobacco issues over here, but chocolate, now we're getting into some territory that's going to be a problem potentially for, for me at right. least. After, <laughs> I'm a chocolate After two myself. o'clock in the afternoon, that's, after a, two, yeah. that's a little after frightening. In the afternoon. Right. Uh, and most people aren't, aren't uh, aware of that. Uh, The problem is, Molly, that we don't value sleep in our society. We're unaware of the deleterious consequences, which I want to talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. We don't know uh, the strategies for getting better sleep. We don't know there's an art to that. We'll talk about that. We suffer, many of us, from sleep disorders like sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Uh, We get too much exposure to blue daylight spectrum light late at night because of the lamps in our bedroom, uh, halogen lamps, uh, and uh, the exposure to TV or any uh, computer monitor or iPad that's going to produce a lot of blue daylight spectrum light. It's like staring at the sun and inhibits the flow of melatonin and delays sleep onset by as much as an hour. If you're reading in bed at night, studying or reading for pleasure, and you've got the wrong lamp, you don't have a warm uh, spectrum lamp as opposed to a daylight spectrum lamp, uh, that is going to inhibit that flow of melatonin, uh, and you're not gonna be able to go to sleep as, as quickly or as deeply. There's also the belief in our society that we can accomplish more if we sleep Mm -hmm. less. Right. Uh, The hustle. The hustle. Yeah. Why sleep? I might miss a party. I'll sleep (laughs) in my bed. Well, she didn't miss any parties, and she died at 27. Yeah. Right. She got got her wish. She got. She died because probably. Yeah. Go ahead. I understand. You know, students tell me all the time, "I'm got a big exam in your class tomorrow. I'm going to pull an all-nighter." Uh, good luck because Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to come into uh, the classroom and your brain is going to be half asleep and your performance is going to be uh, way, way down. And as a culture, we just don't value sleep. That's a big mistake. And uh, why do I say that's a big mistake? Well, what are the consequences of us not getting enough sleep? Drowsiness during the daytime, unexpected sleep seizures. You can be with your eyes wide open one minute, God forbid you're driving a car, and five seconds later, you can be totally asleep and off the road and hopefully not into another car or into a telephone pole. There's a significant increase in heart disease and heart attacks and strokes when you don't get enough sleep. Uh, Type 2 diabetes, onset when you don't get enough sleep, irritability, anxiety, depression, weight gain, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, early onset Alzheimer's disease, and most importantly, a lowered immunity. And especially now with co-virus, if we're not getting enough sleep, we're much more likely to uh, get the virus. Right. We lose our sense of humor. 
we lose our socialization skills, we lose our motor skills, so our athleticism suffers. And as far as our cognitive performance, we have a reduced ability to process material, to concentrate, to remember, to communicate, to multitask. Our creativity drops, our creative problem solving, our critical problem solving drops. We make stupid decision skills uh, financially, socially, behind the wheel of a car, in some reduced health and performance. And how well you sleep is the best predictor of how long you're going to live. Yeah. That Those is. people <laughs> who, uh, who don't sleep much are much more likely to die earlier than those who get adequate rest. That is a long list, Dr. Moss, of uh, things that uh, can go awry and are really the the negative side effects of not getting enough sleep. Yeah, so that is uh, a that is a just a really overwhelming. I mean, really, this is it's everything. Yeah, exactly. Like everything. you said, this is critical, and I very much understand I align with this so deeply because I recently just took a 30 day break from alcohol altogether. I don't, I've been reducing my alcohol intake a lot over the last two years. And so I haven't been drinking a, you know, a very moderate amount uh, previous to this, but in this last 30 days over dryuary, I was completely alcohol free. And I know my Fitbit probably doesn't track everything correctly with my sleep, but I did get my highest sleep score ever during that 30 day period where I was completely alcohol free. And I have to believe that, you know, that was because, uh, par at least partially because of taking that negative, uh, factor out of my healthy sleep equation. Right. Uh, there's no, no, no doubt about it. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that they're sleep deprived. They think that right. how they feel is normal. And then they go on vacation uh, or on the weekends and they sleep extra and suddenly they, they feel better. Mm -hmm. But we become habituated to these low levels of, uh, of sleep, to the low levels of alertness, and we think that's normal. So I'd like uh, with, with our listening audience to uh, have a little quiz right now. That'd be great. And that will help you determine whether you are sleep deprived and need help and need to change uh, or, or not. You can go to a sleep lab and for, have an all night sleep recording, which will cost you about $1,500. Wow. Uh, which will give you a pretty good idea. But uh, we have a quick and much less expensive way. Just answer <laughs> the following five questions and be honest with yourself. Question number one, does a warm room, a boring meeting, a heavy meal, or a low dose of alcohol make you drowsy? Yes or no? Mm. Question number two, do you fall asleep within five minutes of getting into bed? People say, oh, I'm a great sleeper. The minute my head hits a pillow, I'm out. The minute I'm in a situation like on an airplane, before the plane even takes off, uh, I'm out. I can sleep anytime, anywhere. If that <laughs> is you, you are pathologically sleep deprived because wow. a well-rested sleeper takes 15 to 20 minutes to go to sleep. Okay, good. Question number three, do you need an alarm clock to wake up? You should never need an alarm clock to wake up because what it's saying to you is, look, I don't care what your body needs, what your body wants, you've got to go to work. And uh, you should wake up naturally and well rested. Question number four, do you hit the snooze bar repeatedly? Well, yeah, every 15 minutes for an hour and I get another hour's worth of sleep. No, you get about 18 minutes of fragmented sleep. So you mm -hmm. should never have to use the snooze bar. And lastly, do you sleep extra hours on the weekends? Answer yes to any two or more of those questions and consider yourself pathologically sleep deprived wow. and you better do something about it. Wow. Oh, I cannot wait to, I'm going to link all of that in our show notes, folks. So you will be able to access that sleep deprivation quiz. Really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, I can already tell you that 
sadly, I think I already have two of them, even without, regardless <laughs> well, of my well, alcohol well, intake. Um, do. So, yeah. well, you know, what do you do? What we have to do is number one, determine your sleep requirement. How many hours do you need to be fully energetic, wide awake and alert all day long? And uh, for most people, you're going to have to add at least one more hour from what you're doing right now. Okay. The way to do that is for a week, go to bed 15 minutes earlier than usual. And if you're not fully alert all day long the next day, the next week, add another 15 minutes. So as I say, most people are going to have to add about an hour mm -hmm. until they get adequate sleep. And what you have to do is figure out what time you have to get up in the morning, count back seven, seven and a half, eight hours. And that's the time you should be going to bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll make a heck of a, a difference. People that do that say, I never knew what it was like to be awake before. Yeah. They're, they're just astonished. Number two, as important as getting enough sleep and there are individual differences if both of your parents were short sleepers and fully alert all day long you might be one of the lucky two or three percent of the population that can do well on less than six and a half hours oh wow only two most to three people, percent <laughs> most people should get between most adults should get between seven and nine hours of sleep women ten uh, to have more sleep issues and tend to need a little bit more sleep than men. It's not because they're lazy. It's a biological <laughs> thing. I got to think it might be hormonal. <laughs> and often it's, it's hormonal. But as important as meeting your sleep requirement every night is to maintain a regular sleep-wake schedule. To go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time, Monday through Monday, including the weekends. We don't have two circadian rhythms, one for the work week or the school week and one for the weekends. We've got to be constant. So when we get into bed, the body knows then it's time to shut down. And if we keep having a yo-yo sleep wake schedule and going to bed later on the weekends, we put ourselves into eastbound jet lag without leaving home every Monday morning because wow. the body doesn't know when to shut down. We're playing yo-yo with our circadian rhythm. So that's important. It's mm -hmm. also important to get one long block of continuous sleep. It's normal to wake up several times during the night. Most people don't realize that. Okay. But if you're up more than 20 minutes, you're going to be up an entire what we call REM cycle, 90 minutes before you're able to get back to go to sleep again. Okay. So, so let me, I want to make sure I hit that. So if you are, if you wake up in the middle of the night, it's normal. If you stay up for longer than 20 minutes, you're yep. basically going to take yourself out of that full 90 minute cycle. Right. That You're going to have to complete the 90 minute cycle. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And there, there are some, some things that you could do uh, to help you out if you wake up in the middle of the night. Now, I mean, if you just have to go to the bathroom and you keep the lights low uh, and get back into bed, most likely that's not going to affect you the next day. Mm -hmm. But if you go into bright light, if you get distracted, uh, if the television is on or what have you, uh, that's going to keep you up. Uh, but there are some over-the-counter, very safe remedies. There's a a little uh, tube that you can get called Sleep Doctor PM. Mm -hmm. And if in the middle of the night you do wake up, uh, you spray a little seven pushes of a spray bottle under your tongue mm -hmm. uh, and it'll put you right back to sleep without uh, a, uh, a late return to morning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very good. It comes in two formulas. One, you take before you go to sleep to relax you. It has some melatonin and valerian root in it, all natural substances. Mm -hmm. And by being more relaxed, sleep is sleep onset is easier. It's more amenable. Sure. Uh, but whether or not you've taken that 30 minutes before you go to bed, 
if you do wake up in the middle of the night, you can take this reduced strength formula that also comes in these tubes. And as I say, do little seven spritzes under your tongue and it'll put you right back to sleep. Awesome. I'm going to link those in my show notes as well. So you would definitely not recommend, correct, getting having a nightcap, getting that. Uh, no <laughs> nightcaps and try to avoid prescription sleeping pills because uh, especially with alcohol, they can kill you. Sure. Uh, yeah. But uh, alone, uh, they're often uh, subject to subjecting you to some side effects that can be uh, very, very unhealthy. So what we want to do is develop good sleep hygiene, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Get your bedroom environment so it's a great place to go to sleep. Uh, and uh, naturally, let your, let your body and brain do the work that it has, has to do. Right. Uh, being uh, asleep at night, the brain repairs itself. It's, uh, it's just not turning off the motor. In fact, the sleeping brain is more active at night than it ever is during the day. Mm. It's getting rid of toxics uh, that are in your brain that shouldn't be there and uh, helping you make new connections of ideas, things that you've learned during the day. Your brain solidifies a physical record, a memory trace of those things uh, so that you can have that information uh, to work with, to perform well in school with, athletically, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's critical that we do, uh, we do get uh, sleep because the brain needs to uh, go through this uh, wash cycle and, uh, and solidification of memory traces every single night. Right. And if we pull an all-nighter, we just found out recently the University of Pennsylvania uh, that you actually kill neurons. Wow. So students who say, I'm going to pull an all-nighter, uh, they're going to wake up dumber. <laughs> they, uh, not, a good, not a good solution uh, at it's all. It's not as if you <laughs> make up for lost sleep. It's that right. it's, uh, you kill brain You're cells. You're actually killing brain cells. Well, that is very, yeah. that is a definite. Irreversible. Uh, yeah, definitely not something that we want to be happening at all. A very great message for our young younger listeners yeah. as well. So talk to me about sleep hygiene. What does that yeah. mean? Okay, well, not only knowing your own sleep need and getting it every night and doing it at a regular sleep break cycle, your bedroom has to be quiet. It has to be dark. Mm -hmm. It has to be cool between 65 and 67 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got to be relaxing. Uh, that means uh, within an hour bedtime, no TV, no iPad, uh, no video games. Uh, and if you have a clock with an LED dial, um, throw a towel over it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because that, even with your eyes closed, those, that digital light, that's usually a blue light, can get through your eyelids and disturb your sleep. Most people don't realize that. So just uh, cover your clock or turn it around so it doesn't interfere. As I mentioned before, no caffeine after two in the afternoon, no alcohol within three hours of bedtime. Uh, make sure you get exercise during the day, but not heavy exercise too close to bedtime. Mm -hmm. Keep mentally fit. If you're no longer in school or maybe a senior citizen, do crossword puzzles, uh, uh, do uh, games and things yeah. like that, because that's going to help you sleep. Uh, about 50 years ago, I coined a term, power nap. Yeah, I remember. I, I read that. I was going to ask you about that. So you coined the term power, power nap. nap. Is, is it, is it, and it's, so, so is it good for us? A power nap is good for you, not only uh, to uh, help restore missing sleep, but also it's good cognitively for, uh, for learning and problem solving. Uh, even a short nap uh, will help you in terms of cognitive performance uh, during, during the day. The brain is working while you're resting. Now, a power nap I defined is not long, longer than 20 or 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. If it's longer than that, you're gonna go into what we call delta or very deep sleep. And you'll be groggy when you wake up for about an hour or two hours. Right. So if you're 
going to take a power nap, usually in the midday dip of alertness, which is a natural thing. It's not caused by a, a heavy lunch or low dose of alcohol or a boring meeting or a boring teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, it's caused by the drowsiness that's already in your brain, uh, but it's just triggered by by these events of, uh, of kind of boredom. <laughs> right. And uh, alcohol and the heavy meal will will trigger trigger that. Gotcha. But if you, if you uh, are not sleep deprived and you have uh, a heavy meal, uh, it'll make you restless maybe, but it's not going to make you sleepy. Okay. So it's what what's already in your body that uh, that counts. But take a twenty to thirty minute nap or a ninety minute nap, never sixty. Okay. 60 is going to put you up in the middle of a of deep sleep, and, and that's right. going to be disruptive when, when you awaken. Uh, a hot bath uh, or a hot shower, but better a hot bath or jacuzzi uh, within an hour of bedtime will help you relax and raise your body temperature. So when you get into your cool sheets, your body temperature will drop, putting you to sleep quicker and deeper. Um, uh, if you have some anxiety from stress, which is the main cause of insomnia, uh, what you should do is a little meditation during the day, mm -hmm. uh, some relaxation exercises at night, some breathing exercises, uh, where you, uh, for four seconds, inhale as much air as you can, then hold your breath for seven seconds. And then for eight seconds, slowly release that. And if you do this 10 or 15 times, you're going to fall asleep. Uh, it's a way of, of putting your body uh, at ease. Mm -hmm. Another way is progressive relaxation by clenching up your toes as you're lying in bed uh, and then letting go of that, that energy uh, mm -hmm. as you relax your muscles. And then you uh, tighten the muscles in your thighs and your calves, and you work right up through through your forehead, mm -hmm. uh, tensing and then relaxing. And that is going to bring on uh, sleep onset quicker. If you've got a partner that you can convince to give you a massage, <laughs> a back massage or a foot massage, that's an ideal way to fall asleep, uh, as is good sex. If you're uh, worried and stressed about your performance, that is not a way to go <laughs> That's to sleep. not going to help. <laughs> <laughs> but the bedroom should be only for sex and sleep, not for studying or watching TV or any. Do that outside the bedroom. So you're conditioning yourself to uh, sleep as gotcha. being synonymous with uh, as being in the, the bedroom. bedroom, not, not yeah. being. Um, Those are all, all wonderful tips. I love that. And the, um, and you heard it here first folks, the bedroom is only for sex and sleep. So just know yep. it. <laughs> um, yep. You said something about stress and anxiety being um, a, a high cause for insomnia. Uh, right. Yeah. And I wanted to just to, to tie that in a little bit, because I don't know if you're familiar with the science of alcohol in terms of its uh, rebound effect. But one of the things that I've studied and, and um, learned about drinking alcohol, because a lot of people drink alcohol as a response to stress and anxiety. But the way that a the the chemical works in the brain as a sedative has a rebound effect later during that withdrawal when it's leaving the brain to actually spike anxiety after the fact. So yeah. it's, uh, so your, your notes on and your tips on relieving anxiety and relieving stress through meditative breathing or through tensing and relaxing your body, you know, are great for people that are listening just because alcohol is not going to get rid of it folks, but listen to Dr. Moss and those breathing techniques and the tense and relaxing your body, those things will actually help. They'll actually help you get rid of stress and anxiety and help you sleep better. That's right. And that alcohol, which is going to inhibit REM sleep, which you need every 90 minutes. And uh, the first time you enter REM sleep, 90 minutes after sleep onset, 
you'll be in REM sleep for nine minutes. And then every 90 minutes thereafter, the REM period gets twice as long as the previous one. So if you're getting eight hours of sleep, uh, about two hours are going to be REM sleep, which is critical for for memory, for problem solving, for mood, for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And if you um, inhibit REM sleep through alcohol, Mm -hmm. uh, the body's going to try to make up for that REM sleep. And you're going to uh, have some terrific nightmares as a result of, of, Wow, that's not that wouldn't be very pleasant either. <laughs> no, so that's it becomes very difficult because uh, the more you inhibit REM sleep, the more the body wants REM sleep, mm-hmm. and uh, when you uh, keep blocking it and blocking it, it's going to uh, create these uh, night nightmares and and. Uh, just it's just, an, and, yeah, it's kind of an endless, it's kind of an endless cycle. They have these negative impacts, these negative consequences of not sleeping. They, and then that increases, just like you said, negative moods and negative ability to concentrate process, et cetera. And what do they do? They self-medicate with alcohol, trying to put themselves to sleep. And it just, you know, the cycle just keeps perpetuating. Right. So right. Um, if you stop the alcohol or you stop taking Ambien, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right. At first, uh, you're going to have some rough nights and you're going to want to say, Oh my God, I need that alcohol or I need, uh, the sleeping pills. So I won't have these horrific dreams, but, but they, they do pass as you build up your Mm -hmm. REM sleep. Gotcha. Well, uh, Dr. Moss, I appreciate you taking the time to to be on the podcast with me. This has been just, just nugget after nugget after nugget of great information. And I will link all of the tips, all of the websites, the products you mentioned, your website um, is, well, your, your name and then your company, Sleep for Success. I know you have some wonderful products. You have wonderful books um, to also help people gain better sleep habits. So I'm going to link all of that in my show notes. And um, I just appreciate you taking the time so much. What a wonderful wealth of experience and such great information to share with people. Um, I know that that everybody that's listening is going to be very appreciative because getting sleep is critically important to your health, folks. It is critically important to not only your physical health, your mental health, your overall social health, it's it's and your longevity. So listen up take note and don't drink alcohol to try to help you get better because it's not going to, right? Absolutely. It's going to change your, your life to get better sleep, your athleticism, people who think they're, they're average athletes to suddenly get sleep and become, uh, become stars. (laughs) All right. (laughs) See, there's amazing. (laughs) So if you're a golfer and you're frustrated, the best thing you can do, is get more sleep. And if you want a scholar, college scholarship, athletic scholarship, uh, you want better grades in school, and the best thing you can do is get more sleep because your grades will go up and your athleticism will go up. That's awesome. That's fantastic. So no matter who's listening, you know, the, the bottom line is sleep is a critical element to improving your life and your habits overall. So I hope that this podcast has brought you some great information. And um, again, I'll link everything in my show notes. Dr. Moss, I appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Breaking the Bottle Legacy. This podcast is dedicated to helping you change your drinking habits and to create a peaceful relationship with alcohol. Take something that you learned in today's episode and apply it to your life this week. Transformation is possible. You have the power to change your relationship with alcohol now. For more information, please visit me at www.mollywatts.com.